Back on, defendants are present. <coughs> Understand the state is ready to proceed. Yes, Judge. Anything preliminary from the state? No, Your Honor. From Travis McMichael? No, Your Honor. From Greg McMichael? No. From Mr. Bryan? No, Your Honor. All right. The uh, jury is here, ready to go. Let's go ahead and get the panel. Appreciate everybody being ready to go a little bit earlier today. Uh, welcome back. We are ready to go ahead and proceed with the closing arguments in the case from the state. Ms. Donkowski. Thank you, Judge. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so yes, the state has another two hours to speak to you. Now, some of you may be thinking, please, no, I understand this, I get it, I've got it. but. The defense got up here and gave you a lot of information, and the person sitting next to you might have questions that you don't know. So when you get back there in the deliberation room, I want to make sure that I've covered everything so that we're all on the same page as far as the facts and the law go. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to get back to the basics. Okay, we're going to take it back down. We're going to apply the law to the facts, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through this right now. So the burden is on the state to prove this to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, Ms. Hood, Laura Hood got up here yesterday and said, you have to be certain. That's not true. What it is, is it's the doubt of a fair-minded and impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. Not seeking doubt, not beyond all doubt, or to a mathematical certainty. And that's what the judge is going to charge you, okay? All right? It's just beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, do you think they committed the crimes? Okay, if you go, yeah, I think they committed the crimes, you're good. That's all you need. Now, the defendants have raised what we call object affirmative... I'm going to object to that description of what reasonable doubt is. It's clearly not the law. And there's cases recently about... Objection. Okay. The court's going to charge the jury on the definition of reasonable doubt. That is the law that will be provided to the panel. And again, if we could just have everybody argue or in argument, uh, make sure that you are referring to the law that the panel will be charged with so that there's no confusion about the standard that should be applied. Thank you. The doubt of a fair-minded and impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. Not seeking doubt, 
not beyond doubt, or to a mathematical certainty. That's what the judge is going to charge you. Okay? Once again, if you believe they have committed these crimes, and the state has proven it to you beyond a reasonable doubt, you are authorized under the law to come back with a guilty verdict on all the charges. It's as simple as that. Now in this case, the defendants have raised an affirmative defense. And what does that mean? An affirmative defense means, hey, even if you think we really did these things, because the evidence is sufficient to say, yes, we did do these things, the four felonies in the indictment and the murder, hey, we have an affirmative defense which justifies us doing that. For the murder, it's self-defense. For the other charges, it's citizen's arrest. So here's the thing. If you find they didn't commit a citizen's arrest, that's not what they were doing, under the law, they didn't meet the criteria. Okay, I want to remind you guys, ignorance of the law is no excuse. It, it's not like, well, they were probably mistaken. Uh-uh, you can't be mistaken about the law. If you're going to take the law into your own hands, you better know what the law is. So if you find they were not doing a citizen's arrest under the legal standard, okay, the judge is going to give you, well then, it takes it out of self-defense for the homicide, and that means they're guilty on all the charges. All right? It's as simple as that. So count one, malice murder. Remember, premeditation is not required, and the state is not required to prove motive. All right? You may find malice when there does not appear to be significant provocation and all the circumstances show an abandoned and malignant heart. Okay, I want to be real clear. The state is not saying that Greg and Travis McMichael ran out of the house to go murder somebody right then and there. We all know that's not how it works, right? Okay, what happens? Let's give you an example. I'll, I'll make up an example. She's leaving him, right? They're getting a divorce, and she's there to pack up her stuff, okay? He's not at the house to murder her, right? No. But what happens? She's packing up the stuff. They start arguing. They start bickering. Then it starts into shoving. Then it's, if I can't have you, nobody can have you. She's thinking, oh, my God, he's an idiot. She's taking the stuff out of the car. He goes up and kills her, shoots her with a gun, okay? It started out one thing, and it escalated and escalated and escalated. That's how you get to the murder. So don't be fooled, okay? The state's not saying they left the house to go murder a Maude Arbery. What happened? They left the house to go investigate, right? Stop, we want to talk to you. Where are you coming from? What did you do? What's going on, right? And then what happened? Mr. Arbery ignored them, okay? He took off running. He wouldn't do what they were commanding him to do. <coughs> he wasn't obeying their orders. Why? Well, under the Constitution of the United States, he didn't have to do anything except walk away. In this case, he ran away. And they chased him. They backed up on him, and then they followed him down Burker. You saw the Night Owl video repeatedly yesterday when Mr. Goff was here. At that point, I mean, let's face it. To Travis and Greg McMichael, that was a big go jump in the lake. I'll use polite language. I mean, wasn't it? Here they are, ex-law enforcement, Coast Guard. We're demanding that you stop and talk to us. We have questions. Stop, stop right there, talk to us. And he ignores them, basically telling them, yeah, I'm not doing it. And it starts escalating. They start getting mad. Oh yeah? And then all of a sudden, Roddy Brian pulls out then it's like, okay, we'll go around and we'll cut him off over here. We'll go get him. Now they want to get him. Now they want to stop him because they're mad at him. He has totally ignored them and run away from them. And how dare he do that to these two people? Okay, what right did they have to stop Ahmaud Arbery? What right did they have to go ahead and demand a fellow citizen stop and talk to them and then use pickup trucks to try and cut him off and force him to be detained right there on Berkeley? None whatsoever. So when we're talking about malice murder, we are talking about the fact that this can happen. And the judge is going to charge you on this. No specific length of time is required for malice to arise in the defendant's mind. Malice may be formed in a moment, and instantly a fatal wound may be inflicted. Now you see malice? Well, you can consider it as reckless disregard for human life. 
You bring your 12-gauge pump shotgun with you, ready to fire. You point it at a man you know is unarmed. I mean, you think they couldn't tell with those baggy shorts that he didn't have a gun on him? He's being forced toward you by Mr. Bryan and his black Silverado, and then you go ahead and intercept him and pull the trigger without a thought. Abandon a malignant heart. Reckless disregard for human life. And they're in it together. Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael are acting together in concert in the truck. Their actions are all together. They're parties to the crime. Even though Greg McMichael is in the back of that pickup truck on that 911 call, when Travis pulls this trigger, he is still responsible because he's a party to this crime. Because without Greg McMichael, this would never have happened. Now, felony murder, once again, is based on the four felonies. Now, the felony murder is you're committing a felony. There's no intent to go ahead and kill the person. But because you're committing that felony, someone dies. Okay, let's not be fools. We're not talking about but for his parents getting married. That is, that's the red herring. What are we talking about, ladies and gentlemen? But for the felony. Okay, that's the thinking. But for the criminal attempt at false imprisonment. But for the false imprisonment. But for the aggravated <coughs> assault with the motor vehicles. But for the aggravated assault with the shotgun. He wouldn't be dead. That's how you think about it. Look at these crimes and ask yourself, okay, if we take that out, would he be alive? It's real simple. The answer is you can't take out any of these crimes. You take out any one of these crimes that they committed, and he's still alive. All of the underlying felonies played a substantial and necessary part in causing the death of Ahmad Arbery. What do we have? Aggravated assault with a shotgun. Pretty simple. The aggravated assault was continuous. Started with pulling that shotgun up. Ahmad Arbery was 30 to 40 yards away. Not an imminent threat at all. And what did it do? It ended with the pulling of the trigger, shotgun blast here, pellets right here. Did that felony contribute? Of course it did. It's the cause of his death. <coughs> Aggravated assault with pickup truck. I want to be real clear about this. You do not have to hit the person with the pickup truck. The judge is going to charge you that actual injuries to the alleged victim need not be shown. What has to be shown? This. Were the defendant's actions such that it placed Ahmaud Arbery in reasonable fear of immediately receiving a violent injury? What did Mr. Bryan do? He actually ran him into a ditch. Check. I mean, Mr. Bryan right now, aggravated assault with his motor vehicle, check, felony murder, check. Because this contributed to his death. This played a substantial part because it put Mr. Arbery in reasonable fear of Mr. Bryan and that truck. So what do we know? We know that Mr. Arbery was running back up Holmes when Mr. Bryan came back down. And he had to turn around at that blue mailbox. You don't see him turn around. But see how far he is at that blue mailbox? He heads back toward the white truck. If he wasn't already in fear of Mr. Bryan and his Silverado, would he still be alive? Yes. But because of what happened over on Burford, because of the criminal attempt at false imprisonment and this aggravated assault, Mr. Arbery's dead. False imprisonment. You violate the personal liberty of Ahmaud Arbery. You unlawfully confine and detain him. Well, how do you do that? Well, you chase him down with a Ford F-150 or a Silverado. And they did confine and detain him on Holmes. Ladies and gentlemen, come on. We've looked at this. All right? What do we got? We've got Mr. Bryan chasing him up home. Now, yeah, this line doesn't go far enough because what did Travis McMichael tell the police? I stopped a few houses down, got out of my truck, and shouted at him, stop, stop. Now, he denied it on the stand, but that's what he told the police in his written statement, the one he had an hour to fill out, right? So Mr. Arbery got this far and had to turn back around. Then he goes back this way. 
Then he has to go back down this way because now he's turned around. Now he has to come back this way once Mr. Brian turns around. He went up and down this street at least four times. I'm gone, confined and detained on homes. That's false imprisonment. Up and down, four different times, right there. Criminal attempt. You saw the Night Owl video. You saw how fast they took off after him. I mean, Greg Michael's yelling, cut him off, cut him off, cut him off. Travis denies that he did anything to cut off Mr. Arbery. Doesn't even say he pulled in front of Mr. Arbery. But for some reason, Mr. Arbery turns around and runs back. You decide what to believe. But what was he trying to do? What was his intent? He told you what his intent was. Our intent was to stop him. Can't stop somebody. United States of America. Okay? People are free here. They had no authority to demand that he stop. And they're yelling at him. Stop. We want to talk to you. And he's running away. That's the criminal attempt by the McMichaels on Burford. Now, of course, we know the criminal attempt at false imprisonment on Mr. Bryan. He pulled out, pushed him, you know, shoved him, did whatever, got him into a ditch. Now, those actions on Burford, did it put Ahmaud Arbery in reasonable fear of receiving bodily harm? Yes. So now what's he doing? He's running away from them. For five minutes, he's running away from them. If they hadn't put him in reasonable fear of receiving serious bodily harm so that he ran away from them, would he be dead? The answer is no. Therefore, that substantially contributed to his death. Because why? All right. Where did he go? He went up Holmes. Now, this whole thing of, oh, well, the reason he didn't really run out this way is Mr. Albenzi was down there with a gun. Nobody has x-ray vision. Mr. Albenzi had the gun in the pocket of his overalls. Okay? And what do we know Mr. Albenzi did after all this? He went home. Remember? He walks back and he goes on home. I'm sorry, goes on home here. So this idea that Ahmad isn't going to run this way because Mr. Albenzi is out there, we don't know what's in the mind of Ahmad Arbery. Not at all. But what did Mr. Bryan do? Well, Mr. Bryan got in front of him and then went to back up at him, and that's when he turned up homes. Those are the words of Mr. Bryan. I pulled in front of him, I backed up at him, and that's when he turned up homes. Therefore, the criminal attempt at Criminal attempt at false imprisonment substantially contributed to the felony murder. Based on that alone, ladies and gentlemen, criminal attempt at false imprisonment, guilty. Felony murder for that on all of them. Mr. Bryan included, and the McMichaels, guilty on felony murder. So but for his actions, would Ahmad still be alive? If he had not helped to stop Maud with his Silverado, would Ahmad still be alive? The answer is, yes, he would have been. That's all you got to think about is, well, what did he do to contribute to help the <coughs> McMichaels? The answer is yes. <coughs> Mr. Bryan played a substantial and necessary part in causing his death. He is responsible for the murder of Ahmad Arbery. All right, so that brings us to self-defense. All right, I'm just going to go over this quickly. I want you to know what the basics are, the essentials, okay? Because self-defense really applies to the aggravated assault with the shotgun, okay, and the murder charges. So what have we got? One can use lethal force in self-defense, but only under certain circumstances. You can't play self-defense if you are the unjustified initial aggressor, meaning if you started it. Who started it? wasn't Ahmaud Arbery. You're committing a felony against that person. Once again, we're back to our convenience store armed robber. He doesn't get <coughs> to defend himself against the clerk he's robbing. He doesn't get to claim self-defense. He's committing a felony. In this case, they committed four different felonies, including the aggravated assault with a shotgun, they started it. They do not get to claim self-defense. And then, of course, provocation. You can't force someone to defend themselves against you, so you get to claim self-defense. This isn't the Wild West. No. So there's three instances where the defendants don't get to claim self-defense.
self-defense, and they committed all of them. So once again, initially provokes the use of force against himself with the intent to use such force as an excuse. No Wild West. This is the important one. Cannot commit aggravated assault with a shotgun, with trucks, false imprisonment, or criminal attempt at false imprisonment, any of those. Not justified in using force if you're doing any of those things. They were doing all four of them. And you're not justified <coughs> in using force if that person was the unjustified aggressor. You can't start it and claim self-defense. And they started this with their driveway decision. So here's the main concepts. The defendants had to believe the deadly force was necessary. There were no other alternatives. Point a shotgun at somebody. There were a whole bunch of other alternatives to that. That belief must be reasonable. And once again, that's reasonable for everybody. That reasonableness applies to you. That reasonableness, there's no special exception for previous training in the Coast Guard or law enforcement. The reasonableness standard in Georgia applies to everyone equally. The danger to yourself has to be imminent, meaning I am about to get killed. Not some guy I've been chasing for five minutes is running at me. Can't use excessive force. The minute it's excessive, self-defense goes out the window. The defendant's reasonable belief must be what prompts him to use force. What prompted Travis McMichael to pull up that shotgun? He wanted him to stop. He was trying to get him to stop. Oh yeah, you're not going to stop for me and my dad? Up comes the shotgun. Now you're going to stop. Okay, you're not going to stop. You're going to go around the truck. That's fine. He goes to intercept him. He's not afraid. He moved toward Mr. Arbery. He moved toward Mr. Arbery with the gun. He's not afraid. you got to act out of fear. You can't be acting out of anger. That this guy won't stop and talk to you and won't obey your commands. Well, let's see. Ahmad was wearing a t-shirt and cargo shorts that were so baggy he had this big belt loop out here. Let's see. What else? Didn't have a bag or a backpack. So, yeah. Doesn't have anything that he's carrying. He was running with his hands empty at his sides. Ran away from them for five minutes. Did not have any weapon. Nothing on him. Didn't say one word to them. Didn't threaten them verbally. Didn't say, oh yeah, didn't say anything. And he had no help from anyone. So what's there to be afraid of? He went this way, he goes this way, he goes that way. And you see Travis McMichael move down to the center of the, the street there, blocking his way. He's trying to get away. And then, oh look, he's going to go this way. And he does. And he goes around. And what do you have here? Travis McMichael going to intercept. And that shadow underneath there, I mean, you can have the stills back there. We printed some of them out. That shotgun is pointed right at him. Right at him. Okay? So when he gave the police that story about, oh, is it Port Arms? And he was striking me and hitting me and striking me and hitting me. And I finally, you know, I had to do this. That's what he told the police. A bunch of lies. Shotgun. Shadow right here. Okay? Here's the other thing, ladies and gentlemen. Lawyers aren't good at math, but I'm going to trust you guys are. What did the ME say? This arm on a mod artery was 26 inches. This arm on a mod artery was 25 inches. And the barrel of that shotgun is over 28 inches. <coughs> Do the math. Did he hit him? Did he punch him? Did he strike him? When the shotgun's like this? It's easy. Do the math. This is what Travis McMichael did. There's no fear here. There's only anger. Remember, it's a standard of reasonable beliefs that the force used is necessary. Do you really believe he had no other choice but to use his shotgun? 
Is that what you really believe? No other choice. What are the alternatives? Well, the first alternative is don't start this. I'm going to tell you something. My husband, he, uh, he always uh, tells this to our three nephews, David, Ben, and Sam. And what he says is there's some rules for life. You know what those rules are? Don't go looking for trouble because you will find it and it is not going to turn out the way you think it is. What he's really saying to them is, don't be that guy who starts the bar fight and goes, go out, let's go out in the parking lot. That's what he's really saying to them. But it's, it's a life rule. You go looking for trouble and what's going to happen? So don't leave the house. Here's an alternative. Call the police. Don't chase down strangers to confront them. Don't go after pedestrians in your truck. I mean, common sense tells you, you pull up in a truck on somebody who's like a pedestrian who's out for a jog. I mean, I don't know, are any of you runners? You ever had a strange truck pull up that has some people start yelling at you? Would that startle you? I, I don't know. We don't know what was in the mind of Maude Arbery. But, I mean, what do you think? Did it cause some fear for him? These strange men pulling up in this truck and then not relenting and not backing off? This was three on one. How about some empathy? Remember leaps? Listen, empathize. Where's Travis McMichael's empathy? Where's Greg McMichael's empathy? Where do they go? You know, wow, <coughs> I wonder what I'm doing to this other person. I wonder what it looks like from their point of view. I wonder if we might be scaring or startling this person. I wonder if it may be so bad that they might react in a negative way. Where's the empathy? How about don't bring a shotgun with you? This is really easy. Call the police. Because what did Officer Rash want? Remember Officer Rash? He said they want, he wanted them to be witnesses. I mean, so call the police. Follow behind Mr. Arbery at that two miles an hour. Where's he going to go? They could have followed him all the way back to Fancy Bluff and Boykin Ridge. On the phone going, he's turning left. He's turning right. Ooh. Okay? That was a real easy choice. But did they choose to do that? No, they confronted him. They chose to confront him. They didn't need to. They didn't have to. I mean, they could have followed him. He's a jogger. How fast is he going? Don't point a shotgun at people unless you're going to kill him. Don't point a shotgun at people unless you're going to kill him. How do we know he intended to kill him? He pointed a shotgun at him. How about you stay on the driver's side of the truck? Don't go around the front of the truck. Real easy. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at citizen's arrest because this is really important. The law of citizen's arrest, okay? So first off, the defendants never ever said citizen's arrest. They never ever said we're making an arrest. They never said we saw him commit a crime. So ladies and gentlemen, where in the world did the citizen's arrest thing come from? Because it didn't come from the defendants on February 23rd, 2020. Where did it come from? So what is the law? A private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence. What does that mean? Right here, right now, I saw you commit an offense. Okay? I saw you criminally trespass on that property right here, right now, on February 23rd, 2020. I saw you commit a burglary. I saw you commit whatever crime it is. It's in your immediate presence or within immediate knowledge. Okay, we talked about that. The guy at Walmart is not standing next to the shoplifter when she shoplifts, but in real time, what's he doing? He's watching it. We're not talking about videotapes. You can't watch a videotape from November and then have it in your immediate knowledge. Okay, remember, the judge is going to tell you it's synonymous. It means the same thing. <coughs> meaning in your presence or immediate knowledge it means immediately you know because you saw it. That's what that means. That doesn't mean watching a videotape on February 11th with Officer Rash in front of 220 Satilla Drive. That's not what that means. A private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence. Did Ahmaud Arbery commit any offense in the presence of any of these defendants? The answer to that is no. Boom. Citizen's arrest is gone. But yes, I am going to continue because there's some more caveats. 
if the offense, the one that was just committed in your presence, is a felony. Do you get why they're trying to make Ahmad a burglar so desperately? Because if all he's doing is criminally trespassing. Your Honor, I, again, I don't like to interrupt closings, but th this is not an accurate statement of the law that the court is going to give this jury. The parenthetical is not accurate. The parenthetical is mine. Totally mine. Okay. Well, I, I've made an objection, though. I'm mm -hmm. asking her for her ruling. Just explain. Yeah. Yeah. The parenthetical is the what the state is arguing. The rest uh, is the charge of the court. The charge is going to be provided to the panel. And um, with the same explanation I provided a little bit earlier on what the law is going to be, the court is going to provide you the law of the case. <coughs> Counsel, um, you may proceed. Thank you. So, okay. The first sentence is, a private person may arrest offender if the offense is committed in his presence. Okay, you can arrest if the offense is committed in his presence. If the offense, and that's my parenthetical to remind you, if the offense, we're talking about that offense, the one that was just committed in your presence is a felony and the offender is escaping or attempting to escape right then and there. Is that not the not law that the court's gonna give? And, and we've had this discussion. We, it's a in the statement of the law, we would object. I join in the objection. It's noted. You all understand this is my argument. The judge is going to give you the law, right? And he's going to have it written out for you, and he's going to read it to you. But this is the state's argument, that the offender is escaping or attempting to escape. The state's position is, is that what that means is, I saw the crime. I can't chase after the person. I just have to try and arrest them right there. But if it's a felony, if it's a felony, and if they're escaping, they're running away, I get to chase after them. I don't get to chase after them unless it's a felony and they're trying to escape. All right? A private person may arrest him upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. That's the yeah, state's we, position. We have, to, we have to object and have a conference with the court. No, we're going to let the state continue. We talked about this in the charge conference. The objection is noted. We move from this trial stop. Based on the incorrect statement of the law, we join. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please just go ahead and take a step into the jury room. All right, for the jury. The uh, court had a charge conference Friday. I was provided a bunch of arguments over the weekend that we are making part of the record. So uh, I understand the objection is being made to the, uh, the, the law. Uh, I've indicated the law is going to be provided to the panel. I've indicated the court's position with respect to the law. So. With that, I'd like to get the closing argument done, but I'm more than happy to hear the motion for mistrial and um, proceed from there. Your Honor, based on the final draft of the charge the court provided us, I guess yesterday morning, um, the, the court is gonna charge that a private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the perpetration of the offense or in the case of felonies during escape. If the observer fails to make the offense the arrest immediately after the commission of defense or during escape in the case of felonies, his power to do so is extinguished. That's not what the state's arguing. They're, or they're arguing and. And it's a clear misstatement. The court should simply instruct the state not to argue an incorrect statement of law rather than putting the burden back on the jury to understand what the state's saying, what we're saying, and now what the charge is saying. The court has the power to do so and should do so. In further support of the motion for mistrial, on behalf of Greg McMichael, obviously this is the last word by any counsel in the case, and to argue the state's case, which we're perfectly fine with their doing, is to argue the facts and evidence as
as the law applies to them, but not as a misstatement of the law applies to them that we can't correct except by making a, an objection when the incorrect law is being given to the jury by the state. So there's no way we can fix it. We're asking the court to fix it, not by simply saying to the jury that the law is going to come from the court, which it will, but that this is a misstatement of the law and this argument is improper. Would you like to state? Thank you, Your Honor. Yesterday the defense got up here and argued their interpretation of the law, and I didn't object at all because I knew it was their interpretation of what they believe the law to be. They went through the whole probable cause thing. They called him a burglar. They went through everything. The state didn't object because I understood that this was their position of the laws applied to the facts. I've just made it clear to this jury, and I will again, that this is what the law is, and this is how you apply it to these facts, and this is the state's interpretation of how you read this law, just like they gave their interpretation in their closings yesterday. So we ask that you deny the mistrial. Five words. Well, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You can argue the law. You can't argue a misstatement of the law. The state never told the jury this is my interpretation of the law until we objected. Well, I think that's what was explained in the parenthetical, but the state does need to – I will – the state needs to clarify that this is the argument based on the law that will be charged and what the law that will be charged and make sure that we're clear about what the law is that's being charged. I'm not – there was a debate about this on Friday, and I'm not going to reignite that debate in front of the panel. We're perfectly – we're fine with what the court's decision was on the contemporaneousness of the events. The charge is great. It's the state's argument about what that means that's flawed, and it's fatally flawed. Well, the state has the right to – just like the defense had the right to argue that what escape means is escaping whatever this temporal period is. I understand the state to be arguing the same thing in a much more limited temporal period. I think the state's got the right to do that. The state needs to be sure, though, that it's clear that that is the argument that is being made as opposed to what the law is, and I think the charge is very clear about that. So the motion for mistrial is denied. If I may add, though, the state is arguing that the felony for the second sentence has to have just occurred in the immediate presence of the person seeking to arrest the escaping felon. That is absolutely a misstatement of the law. Even as the court agreed to charge it, that's not even correct. The second sentence does not require the felony to have occurred within the immediate presence contemporaneous with the escape and the chase. That is not the law. That's not the law the court agreed to charge. Your Honor, you're charging the statute, and the statute are those two sentences. The state's interpretation of that statute is if the offense – well, that is – the offense has to be committed in your presence or immediate knowledge. If that offense is a felony – I mean, that's what it says. If that offense – well, it's referring back to that first sentence, and the state's interpretation is then that means that felony had to be committed in your presence. The person had to be escaping right then and there, and that's the state's argument to them that they never saw anyone escaping from a felony that had been committed that day. That's not what the court's charging. Yeah, that's not what was in it. So the escape – the second sentence the court was charging, which I understood was agreed to, was that if it's a felony and there was an escape, that's the temporal issue that we're talking about, then that – those steps can be taken to detain the – or arrest the individual. What I understood the defense was arguing is that this temporal period stretched over some time. And what I understood the state was arguing was no, that temporal period is limited to what had occurred there, the escape. The word escape was he was escaping from whatever may have occurred that day. Yes, that is what we're arguing. Okay, well, that's not what I'm hearing then because what I'm hearing is – well, if the state limits its argument to that, that that's what the second sentence refers to, an escape, that limited temporal period, 
then that's permitted. That's what we talked about in the charge conference. Yes, Judge. I don't think that is what, what we argued about by email and all the rest, Your Honor. Well, that's what I remember. That's what I'm saying. The state will limit its argument to that. Okay. Your Honor, if it's okay for me to step out just for a second, I, I will not disturb the jury if they're back by the time I get back. All right. I could also use a bathroom break. I assume that's what Mr. Hubbard is looking for. Okay. Let's just take literally five minutes, and then we'll get back into this. Thank you, Judge. Thank you.
Is that ready to proceed? Yes, sir. All right, let's get the panel. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you for your patience. I understand we are ready to proceed. Yes, thank you, Judge. Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, the judge is going to give you the law. He's going to read it to you. He's going to give it a copy to you. So you're going to have it back there with you. I encourage you to read it. So let's get back to where we were, the law on citizens' arrest. Where we are is a private person may not act on the unsupported statements of others alone. Okay? All right, so what that means is, once again, we're back to... Did the offense happen in your immediate presence or in your immediate knowledge? How do you get immediate knowledge? Meaning, immediately it happens. Synonymous, right? So that isn't rumor, gossip, hearsay that a crime has been committed or that some other person thinks this other person committed this crime. You can't base your citizen's arrest on that sort of stale information from unreliable sources. That's not what you can do. Okay? You can't base an arrest on gossip alone. Facebook does not alone give you probable cause to go arrest somebody. Rumors in the neighborhood do not give you probable cause alone to go and arrest somebody. That's not what immediate knowledge is. A private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the perpetration of the offense or in the case of felonies during the escape. Okay, so what's that mean? Why is warrantless highlighted? Okay, because a citizen's arrest is a warrantless arrest. You don't have an arrest warrant that, you know, a law enforcement officer has sworn out before a judge at all. This is a warrantless arrest. And so for the warrantless arrest under citizen's arrest, the arrest must occur immediately after the crime was committed or in the case of a felony during the escape. That means the person's escaping, you're chasing them, and you have to arrest them right then and there. That's what that means. Now, remember... The defense got up here and said, well, of course, how would a law enforcement officer ever arrest anybody if the crime happened over here and then they arrest them later? Well, we all know that law enforcement officers go out and get <coughs> arrest warrants, okay? That's what they do. They go ahead and they, 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 know, they know Linda has been committing shoplifting, okay? They get called, they witness her, she runs out, okay? They don't arrest her that day. So the, what does the officer do? He takes out an arrest warrant for her. That's how she gets arrested later on the arrest warrant for shoplifting because she wasn't arrested by the law enforcement officer on that day when he saw her shoplifting. He takes out a warrant and arrests her later. So that answers that question that the defense brought up. All right. Law and citizen's arrest. If the observer fails to make the arrest immediately after the commission of the offense, or during escape, in the case of felonies, his power to do so is extinguished. Okay? So, when you're in the store, and the woman's shoplifting, and you go to do a citizen's arrest, you have to do it right then and there. She comes back in the store four days later, yeah, you, you can't arrest her. You can't do a citizen's arrest four days later. It has to happen. 
If you fail to make that arrest immediately after the commission of the offense, you have no power to do a citizen's arrest. In other words, I mean, in other words, I mean, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about citizen's arrest for emergency situations. Judge, I emergency situations. I object to this interpretation, which is a misstatement of the law. We join in that objection. It's noted uh, this is the argument that's being made. That's, I've already addressed that. Except that it says law on citizen's arrest, not the inference as the court was uh, making clear to the state. Not their interpretation, but the law, it says. Okay. Uh, this, uh, maybe semantics with the slide. I, I don't know, and I have not gone through the slide. The, the law of the case will be provided by the court. All right. This is uh, argument. This is the state's argument concerning uh, what should be the facts of the case and how to apply them to the law. The slide, to the extent that it indicates that this is the law on citizen's arrest, is again, uh, as I understand, demonstrative. Uh, the court is going to provide that. Ms. Doncaster. Thank you. It says, in other words, this is me sort of summarizing it for you. This is the state's argument. You all understand that, right? This is just the state's argument. And the state's argument is that citizen's arrest is for emergency situations. When something's happening, they are right in front of you, and you want to go ahead and act as a citizen and arrest the person because you just saw the crime happen. That's what it's for. So what we have is, I'm sorry it says law and citizen's arrest. This is once again a summary slide done by the state. This is the state's argument to you that the crime is committed in your presence. Immediate knowledge is not the unsupported statements of others alone that a private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the offense. And if it's a felony and the offender is escaping or attempting to escape, you can chase them and then make your arrest. Okay? That's it in a nutshell, right there. All right. So we're going to apply that law to the facts of this case, right? So what crime are we talking about that they thought he had committed? Was it clear to you at all, based on their closing arguments, what they were talking about? All right. Well, it can't be October 25th, 2019, because Ahmad was on the dock. And he didn't take anything. All right? So, what do we have? Well, we don't even have criminal trespass. Because criminal trespass is when you enter on the property of someone else to do an unlawful act. All right? You decide. Did he enter on to 220 Satilla Drive on the dock to commit an unlawful act? Well, go ahead and look at the video. Didn't touch any of that stuff didn't steal any of that stuff out on the dock. Wandered around and looked around on the dock. All right? Let's talk about Larry English here. Larry English was not concerned about people there in the daytime. He didn't bother to even collect those daytime videos. Kelly Parr told you, yeah, there was a Sunday I saw a mod there in the doorway. You know? We don't know if it was December or January. Larry English couldn't have cared less. Might have been instances of other people there during the day, but he couldn't remember because he didn't care about people coming on the property during the day. What did he tell you? He told you he could remember his subcontractors were there, the kids came over there, and Mr. Billy. Don't know who Mr. Billy is. He would sometimes shut off the video cameras and not turn them on for days. Remember in his deposition, he said, yeah, I'd, I'd shut them off because they kept going off, because people were over there, and I'd forget about them and not turn them on. Okay, so he's concerned about his property, but he's concerned about liability because of those kids. He doesn't want one of those kids falling off his dock. Per Larry English, he's a contractor. And by the way, Larry English is the one who referred to it as a construction site. Remember, during his deposition, he called it the construction site. In his experience, it's very common as a general contractor to have people come in and out of the construction site. And what did he tell you? He told you this in his deposition. Nothing had ever been stolen from the construction site in all of 2019 and the first two months of 2020. Let's be really, really clear. This whole boat thing, that's a red herring. All right? Total red herring. Nothing had ever been stolen from the construction site. And you can see how much stuff is in there. You got lumber. You got all this stuff. 
Mr. Arbery never shows up with a bag, doesn't back a U-Haul up to it and start loading out that big saw or anything like that. What does he do? He wanders around inside for a few minutes and leaves. That's all he does. But during late October or the beginning of November 2019, we have no idea what the actual date is, Larry English climbs up a ladder and looks down into his boat that's parked there and goes, oh my gosh, my stuff's missing. Okay, he notices it sometime in the end of October, beginning of November. He can't even tell you what date that was. Okay, and he calls Rash. He goes, okay, Rash, you know, what do I do? And he talks to Rash about this and says, well, I don't know when the stuff was stolen. I don't know who stole it. I think it was my subcontractors who stole it. They're the first subjects, suspects. But he also notes that the boat had been back and forth to Douglas where he lives during this time frame. So Larry English, when he's talking to Rash, now knows, I don't know when it was stolen, I don't know who stole it, I don't know where the boat was, and he decides to not even get the police involved. Because what does Rash say? If you want to report it to the police, what do you do? Call the non-emergency number, and an investigator will come out and take a report from you. We'll interview you figure out what everything is. But what are the suspects from Larry English's point of view? Well, it's his subcontractors. It's the looky loos the white couple with the bag. I mean, that's from the 911 call. He thinks they're the people. And then it might have been the four teenagers in Douglas. So it can't be sometime in October, November when Larry English noticed the items missing from the boat, okay? Because we don't even have enough for Larry English to call the police and even do an investigation into this because he doesn't know where the boat was, much less, much less what date the stuff was stolen off the boat was. We don't know what date this took place. So he never told Travis McMichael, never spoke to Greg McMichael, never talked to William Roy Bryan about any of this, this, this boat thing, okay? Travis McMichael knew the boat thing from gossip. An unreliable source, stale information. Who told it to him? He told you, his mother. Greg McMichael knew about this, from Officer Rash. And what did Rash tell you? Yeah, I went down and talked to Greg and Michael and told them that Larry English had the stuff stolen off his boat and that he suspects his contractors. They knew better. What was the intent? I mean, Officer Rash told you, my intent here was for Greg and Michael to be a good witness for the police. He's supposed to be a good witness. If he sees the guy over there again, he's supposed to call 911. And then he's supposed to go, hey, he went this way, he went that way. That's what he's supposed to do, be a good witness. Greg offers his contact information to Officer Rash to give it to Larry English, but Larry English never gets his text. He totally ignores it. Never makes contact with Greg McMichael. Never authorizes Greg McMichael to act on his behalf at all. Now, Larry English, it's completely reasonable. I mean. Look at this, this is what the actual owner of the property wants to have happen. This is what the owner wants. Find him, talk to him, and tell him not to come back. Okay, that's a totally reasonable response. Completely reasonable. Just, Officer Rash, just tell the young man to please stop coming on the property. Because what happens? My blink alarm thing goes off, and then I have to call the police, and then I have to call Diego Perez, and this is a real hassle. He never takes anything, never steals anything, but you know, my camera's gone off. Can you just tell him not to come back anymore? What did Officer Rash tell you? One of the last questions Officer Rash was asked on the stand, what did he say? Well, if Larry English had called the Glen County Police Department to report the theft of items from his boat, what would have happened? An officer would have been assigned to investigate the case, meaning he would have interviewed Larry English. What would he have said to Larry English? sir? What was taken? When was it taken? Well, Larry English wouldn't have been able to say when. And who took it? Well, it was my subcontractors, I think. But then there was this white couple, I think. And by the way, I think they're living under the bridge. And, you know, I don't know. And then there's this young man who keeps coming in, but he never takes anything. So this idea that Ahmad would be a suspect, he's a suspect along with a whole bunch of other people, okay? So here's the problem. If you're a suspect and you're a suspect and you're a suspect, the police don't come out of fact and go, I'm gonna arrest him. I mean, that's not what they do. They actually investigate it, right? Like, like law enforcement officers. So the idea would be that an officer would go and look into it. That's exactly what Rash said on the stand. Do you remember this? He said, Ahmad might be a suspect, but he would look into it. 
We don't even know when this stuff was stolen. Ahmad would not have been automatically arrested just because Larry English made contact with the police. There would have been an investigation. That's what Rash told you. Rash, an actual law enforcement officer with a badge in a marked patrol car. So then we got the white couple with the bag. He calls the police on December 2nd. They're the suspected boat thieves now. Remember, even on December 1st, he's calling the police going, yeah, these are the thieves who stole the stuff off my boat. I want you to go and check them out. Now, here's what's really important. Larry English called the police and said, please go check out the white couple. They're homeless, living under the bridge. He did not go himself to confront the people under the bridge. I want you to compare and contrast this. So what do we know about Greg McMichael and Travis McMichael at this point in time? July 13th, they went down and confronted the homeless man under the bridge with their guns. And then called the police to tell them about it that he's a shady looking guy. February 11th, Travis McMichael runs home, tells his dad they get their guns and they head back down to 220. He says, I'm calling parked in front of 220. All right? Where's Greg and Michael at that time? He's inside with his gun, about to run into Diego Perez, who's inside with his flashlight in his gun. Neither Diego Perez or Greg and Michael bothered to tell Officer Rash that they had both been inside already with their firearms on February 11th. Did they? Nope. And you'll note, that the 911 operator stayed on the phone with Travis McMichael the entire time until <coughs> Officer Rash arrived. That's important. Stayed on the phone the entire time so Travis could keep reporting what he was seeing. So now we November 18th, 2019. They don't know anything about November 18th, 2019 until they're shown some videos on February 11th of 2020. So they don't even know about this. And it can't be December 17th, 2019, because nobody knew about that at all. Even Larry English, I don't know. I found these on my phone. I never paid attention to them. Police weren't called. Nothing happened. Okay, but what do we know? Okay, a couple of things. Let's look at this. Uh, I want you to watch this. Ah. What's Mr. Aubrey doing? More importantly, what's Mr. Aubrey not doing? Alright. Here's the thing. Alright. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm really scared, but I'm gonna do it. It's pitch black. Okay, it's pitch black. I'm in the house. I can't see. Okay, I know there's a table. I seriously do. There it is. Okay. Did you see Mr. Arbery do that? Did you see him do this? Did you see him run his shin into anything? Did you see him run into any of this furniture or this equipment? They keep claiming it's pitch black in there. Does he look like he's acting like it's pitch black? Okay. No. I don't know how he's seeing. I don't know if it's the street light. I don't know if it's the moonlight. I don't know if it's a combination of those things. But for him, he can see what's going on inside. What here? Just skirted that lawnmower. Didn't run into it. Didn't bash his elbow on it. And here's what we know Mr. Arbery did on December 17th. After he went in there for a few minutes and looked around, didn't take anything, didn't damage anything. This is what he did. So, can't be February 11th, 2020. That's not the crime we're talking about that they're trying to do a citizen's arrest for. Because a private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the offense. If you fail, fail to immediately arrest, you can't arrest later. Okay, and what do we have here? Well, we know what we have here. We have criminal trespass, at the most, according to law enforcement officer Rash, who then said it was loitering prowling. But first off, I want to address this. Empathy, once again. 
Where's the empathy from Travis McMichael? Travis McMichael's point of view is, I pulled up and I got out of the car and had a confrontation with this guy because I, I, I was about to say, what are you doing here? And then he put his hand near his pocket and then I jumped back in my car. Well, okay, let's think about this. Empathy. Doma's actions afterwards, does it look like he thought he was just in a confrontation when he walked into the house on February 11th? What did he do when he walked in the house on February 11th? <coughs> Wandered around, looked around for a few minutes, and was gone by the time Diego Perez gets over there with his gun, right? So what have we got? Does it look like he just saw someone in a car out front and it was no big deal to him? I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. I have no idea. You saw the video. What does it look like from the video? Is he in there hiding? Is he in there crouched down? Or is he just wandering around as usual inside? Remember, no one had ever told him to not be on that property. So the thing is, what you're saying to me is you're going, but Linda, the defense got up here and said he's a burglar. He's a burglar, he's a burglar, and he committed all these burglaries. Well, why are they saying that? Well, because they want it to be a burglary so that it's a felony, so that if he's escaping from that felony that he committed that burglary, they can chase him down. But they didn't know he had done anything that particular day on February 23rd, 2020. What's burglary? When without authority and with the intent to commit a theft therein, that person enters or remains within the dwelling of another. Okay. Criminal trespass. When that person knowingly and without authority enters upon the land or premises of another for an unlawful purpose. Okay, so what do you got? Kind of really similar. One's a felony, one's a misdemeanor. Right? Criminal trespass, a misdemeanor. So what's really important right now is what did the defendants know on February 11th, 2020? What did they know? Just got adulterer out by the driveway. There's some blacks right in there. Oh, is that right? They, uh, uh, matter of fact, I don't come to think of it, I kept forgetting about them. They have some kids that age mm -hmm. that hang around that house. Yeah. Well, I've been there for an actual a, a report of an alleged assault or whatever, and it's the kids they have are only females. Now, I don't know if it's one of them's boyfriend. They only had daughters there, so it could be unless somebody's moved in with them or whatever. But, um, yeah, nobody seems to know who this kid is, where he's coming from. But, like, he, he's always... And all the times on the video that Mr. English has sent me, he's sending me one now, it's always been just in there plundering around. He hasn't seen him actually take anything. I said, so, you know, it's criminal trespass. Yeah, 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 very least. So, well, ordering and prowling. Stolen. I had it reported. It's stolen yeah. on the first right down the road. Um, now, we did have, um, I took a report down the road here, the house on the corner, the guy uh, where the Jeep and all is, he had some stuff stolen of some guns stolen, but we got on video the car that people had come in and stole them. They were from another neighborhood. Yeah. How y'all doing? What's up, man? Hey, buddy. What did they know? In front of Travis McMichael, Greg McMichael specifically says to Officer Rash, this is criminal trespassing. A misdemeanor. Why is it criminal trespassing? He's never taken anything. He's never stolen anything. Nothing had ever been taken from the construction site. Officer Rapp says it's loitering and prowling. So on February 11th, 2020, at 7.30 at night, Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael know there's absolutely no evidence that Mr. Arbery has committed any felony or theft from the construction site, from the owner himself, and from a police officer. This is what they know on February 11th. What was M Officer Rash's plan? This is important. Officer Rash, Glenn County police officer. What was his plan when it came to Mr. Arbery? Was to get his identity information, inform him that this was private property, call Larry English in front of Ahmaud Arbery, put him on speakerphone, let the owner, the owner, Larry English, make the decision to either just ask Ahmaud not to come back or to have the police Trespass him, meaning I'm giving you an official trespass warning. If you ever come back here again, you'll be arrested. This was Officer Rash's plan. Reasonable. 
This is what Larry English wanted. Just somebody tell him to stop, not come back, please. That's all. That's all. Robert Rash took the stand. He said a couple more things that were very, very important in this case. How do you identify a burglar? He was asked by the defense this. What did he say? Caught taking from something from the house. This is your Glen County law enforcement officer, Rash, who's on the case, who's been in, talking with Larry English constantly, knows all about this. What did he say to the defense? How do you identify a burglar? Because they get caught taking something from a house. Then he was asked, but wait a second, isn't burglary you enter with the intent to commit a felony or theft therein? What did he say? How would I know what his intent was? Right. Right. How would Officer Rash know what Ahmaud Arbery's intent was? Right there. Said it right in the stand. But the defense, of course, says, well, there are things of value in there. Okay, but those things of value have been in there. They were in there all of 2019. They were in there October, November, December, January, and February. And they were never stolen or taken, ever, by anyone, including Mr. Arbery. It's not a burglar. So how do, how do you analyze this case? Well, was it a citizen's arrest? You decide. But if they were not conducting a lawful citizen's arrest, you do not have to consider, you still may if you want to, but you don't really have to consider self-defense because <coughs> if it's not a lawful citizen's arrest, then they were the first unjustified aggressors and they were committing felonies against Mr. Arbery and therefore they don't get to claim self-defense. And you can go directly to the charges in the indictment. All right, so it's not a citizen's arrest. This is the state's argument. No crime, not a burglary, not criminal trespass committed in the defendant's presence. None whatsoever. The suggestion that the victim committed a burglary in 2019, you can't arrest him now because he's not escaping from those things. Think about this. How is someone escaping from October 25th out on a dock? How is someone escaping from February 11th, 2020? on February 23rd, okay? That is irrational. Wanting to question the victim demonstrates their uncertainty on what he had done that day, and wanting to question the victim demonstrates a lack of immediate knowledge which is required for a lawful citizen's arrest. They didn't see him commit any crime that day. And the state's not saying he wasn't in 220, you know, in, yeah, 220 Satilla Drive. We all know he went in there and wandered around and then came out and then ran off down the street. We all know that. They didn't know that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the evidence in the case. So first off, once again, where are we? Satilla Shores, Royal Oaks is next door, Fancy Bluff, that's where Ahmaud Arbery lives. There's US 17, the expressways over there 95. Ahmaud Arbery. Yesterday, Laura Ho got up here and she gave you Criminal Defense 101. Hmm. Usually Criminal Defense 101 is no crime actually took place. Well, crime's on video. My client didn't commit the crime. Well, yeah, your clients are on the video committing the crime. Criminal Defense 101, step three. It's the victim's fault. Standard, standard stuff. Malign the victim, the victim's fault. I know you're not going to buy into that. It's offensive. He lived 1.8 miles away. There was his residence. There's the house under construction. Only 1.8 miles away. February 23rd, 2020 at 1.08 p.m. Mr. Arbery walks up to the open, unsecured construction site. We have our Olson video. Remember, it's off by an hour and five minutes. Per the video from inside 220, Mr. Arbery does not take anything, just does what he always does, wanders around and leaves. It's not a burglary, okay? How would you know what his intent was? Well, did he steal anything? No. Did he leave like he always does? Yes. It's a Sunday afternoon 
and Mr. Albenzi calls the non-emergency police line at 108. I said to him, why didn't you call 911? Because this was not an emergency. It wasn't an emergency. Mr. Albenzi, just, just another guy over at that house, again, the house that's unsecured, doesn't have a fence, doesn't even have no trespassing signs on. He had sent somebody out when it's convenient. Not an emergency. Greg McMichael is in front of 230 Satilla Drive alone, and he sees Mr. Arbery running down the street. Driveway decision one. How do we know he didn't witness any crime? But the whole thing started when I saw this guy running down the street. He does not know that Mr. Arbery was inside 220. He only sees him running down the street. Travis McMichael certainly didn't know anything. He's inside on the sofa. Greg McMichael assumed the worst. And so I thought, well, you know, he's running from somebody. He's just done something. You know, he might have hurt somebody or whatever because, you know, this guy's been in and out of that damn house, one house over and over and over again, got him on videos and everything. That is not sufficient for a citizen's arrest. This is not probable cause. This is, I don't know what in the world this guy was doing, but he's running down the street real fast. That's what this is. And remember, he's talking to the police about what he believed Ahmaud Arbery had done that day. He must have done something today. He's running down the street. Let's chase after him with guns. That's what happened. Driveway decision. Greg McMichael chooses to arm himself with a handgun. Travis McMichael chooses to arm himself with a pump shotgun. These are their choices. Travis McMichael had his cell phone, but Greg McMichael does not take his cell phone to him. All right. This is really important, ladies and gentlemen. On February 11th, the 911 operator stayed on the phone with Travis McMichael the entire time. Right? So if Greg McMichael had actually made contact with the 911 operator, what would have been happening inside the truck? He'd have been on the phone with that 911 operator going, yeah, he's going this way, he's going this way, he's going that way. Okay? The fact that Greg McMichael was not on the phone with 911 giving them a play-by-play tells you that Travis and Greg knew they weren't, they had not called 911. <coughs> Travis knew his dad hadn't called 911. Okay? Neither one of them called 911. They had no intention of calling 911. Just like they went and confronted the homeless guy under the bridge and then called 911. Just like they ran back down on February 11, 2020, to the house and then called 911. What do they do? They get their guns, they go to do a confrontation, and then they call 911. Greg McMichael didn't even bother to take his cell phone with him. Obvious to Travis, he did not call 911. Travis McMichael. 60 seconds after Mr. Arbery has run past 230 Satilla Drive, he makes his driveway decision. Doesn't tell his dad to calm down. Doesn't tell his dad that no, he's not getting a shotgun and running after somebody. Not, doesn't tell his dad, this is a really, really bad idea. We shouldn't do this. No, what does he do? His white F-150 pickup truck backs out of the driveway and heads in the direction that Mr. Arbery was running. This happens after he gets his shotgun and getting into his pickup truck. Travis McMichael testified that he went to the end of the driveway and he saw Mr. Albenze point one time down the street. There was no verbal communication by Mr. Albenze with the McMichaels. That was a lie. Can you all see this okay? Am I blocking away? All right. So what we have here, as you can see, is Mr. Albenze, right? Here's the black car. Remember the black car goes by, then Mr. Arbery runs the other way, down this way, right? So let's go ahead and play. There goes the black car. Mr. Albenze is there. There goes him on. Do you see him? Right there. Maud's running, running. There he goes, right there. You see him? Down the street. 
And there he goes. All right? Then what happens? See the white truck right here? You're looking at it? Somebody comes out. Goes to the door of the truck. Mr. Albenza is still right here underneath the tree. Somebody else comes out. You see the second person come out and go around the front of the truck? Gregory Michael. Because where's Gregory Michael? Gregory Michael's going into that, sitting in that car seat, right? Second person comes around. Then what happens? Then Mr. Albenzi walks down the street. He's walking, he's walking, he's walking, he's walking. Truck pulls out. Wow. Truck pulls out. Mr. Albenzi does his pointing when the truck is already pulled out and going down the street. Want to see it again? Back it up. Here's the black car. There goes a mod. Running down the street. There he goes. This is the white truck. He's still underneath here. There comes somebody in the truck. He's right there. There comes Gregory Michael. He comes around. He gets in. Then Mr. Albenzi starts walking down the street. Chuck pulls out. There goes his arm. There goes his arm. Where's the truck? Already pulled out. Already pulled out and heading down the street. Should you trust the statements of Travis McMichael? Now, well, let's go ahead and first take a look at this. He told you he's not going to chase or investigate someone who is armed. <coughs> and yet all he talked about was, well, he kept reaching in his pants, he kept reaching in his pocket. Well, did you think he was armed or not? Then what did he tell you? This is what I was thinking. Mr. Aubrey may have run by. Maybe Matt had seen him. Maybe he has broken in. Maybe Larry English is over at 220. I don't know. Maybe Ahmaud Aubrey was caught. Maybe Ahmaud Aubrey is running from the police. These are all maybes. He doesn't know anything. These are all the maybes he testified to. He said he assumed he was committing a crime. That's what he said on the stand. Remember, I wrote it out. You said you assumed he was committing a crime. I went down there to see if it was him. Then he said, I don't know. I don't know what he did that day. I don't know. Then he wanted to talk about his totality of the circumstances and all that stuff that he knew that was going to allow him to do the citizen's arrest. What did he talk about? Well, I heard from my mom about the stuff stolen off the boat. <coughs> okay, well, can't arrest somebody on the unsupported gossip of someone else. Can't do that. And then, you know, I saw him inside the house, and I knew he was in there a couple other days because I'd seen video on February, you know, on February 11th, he saw these videos. Okay, well, that's not having committed a crime in his immediate presence. This is somebody showing you some stuff later. And then, he knew about the white couple. Oh, yeah, I knew there were other suspects for stealing the stuff and other suspects who had gone in the house, the white couple. Okay? And then, he also said, well, yeah, and then there was the shady-looking guy under the bridge. He was also kind of a suspect. He said, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. What happened down the road? I was ordering him to stop. What gives you the right to order the Maud Arbery to stop? My impression was that he could be a threat. Because who knows what can happen? 
Oh my God. Self-defense, you have to think you're in imminent danger of receiving serious bodily harm or death. It's imminent that it happened and I'm about to die. My impression was that he could be a threat. Yeah, who knows what could happen. You guys got on stand. So what else have we got? If Greg had called 911, he still would have been on the phone with 911. We know that. That's how 911 works. They stay on the phone with you. He knew he wasn't on the phone with 911. He told you he didn't know what his father was saying to him on. Really? Do you, does anybody believe that? That he, he's in the car with his dad, but he has no idea what it was that his father was actually saying to Ahmad as well as what he was saying. Now, what did he talk about? He talked about that like continuum of the use of force and blah, blah, blah. Level two is commands. Okay. I'm sorry. How do police officers command people to do stuff? How do they usually do that? Because police officers, I mean, are they yelling at you? Or are they politely saying stuff to you when they're commanding you to do things? Do you believe for a minute he was talking softly to Ahmaud Arbery? What's going on? What are you doing? Please stop for me. Do you really believe that for one minute? I'm going to ask you another question. Do you think this Travis McMichael who took the stand was the same Travis McMichael from February 23rd? You think they're the same person? Or you think this is trial preparation? What tone of voice do we have being used by the McMichaels? Nine one one was the address of emergency. Uh, I'm not here. Is it Tilda Shores? Is a black male running down the street? Sotilla, where, where, where at Sotilla Shores? I don't know what street we're on. Is it? Stop right there. Is it? Stop. Grab it. Sir, hello? Ask yourself, was that the tone of voice being used? Well, yes, we know it was. He just said, stop. God damn it, stop to Mr. Arbery in that tone of voice. All right, use of force continuum. Presence. Did not have no badge, no uniform, no authority. Just some strange guys in a white pickup truck. Strangers. Verbal commands. They don't have any authority to use verbal commands. This is a fellow citizen. It's another human being. They're pulling up on him and they're commanding that he stop and talk to them. And then, of course, he skipped level three, level four, level five and went right to deadly force. Boom. Someone's dead. Claims he didn't cut off a mod on Burford, did not get out with his shotgun. I don't know, you believe any of that? Told the police he got out of his car in Holmes a few houses down and yelled at a mod to stop. Now he says that didn't happen. And his convenient excuse is I was really confused. What did he say the Coast Guard goals were? To not escalate, but to keep everyone calm and cool. You don't want anything to escalate. But then he tells you, oh, but you pull out a shotgun and point it at somebody to de-escalate a situation. What are you talking about? Does this logic make any sense to anybody? Travis McMichael never said to the police, I was making an arrest, I was trying to arrest him for the crime of this. Wouldn't that be really, really important? Hey, I was trying to effectuate a citizen's arrest for this crime that I know he committed. Wouldn't that be something you'd tell the police? Never once. Never told Mr. Arbery he was under arrest. Never said, I saw him commit the crime of blank today. Because he didn't, he was sitting on his sofa. Never said, I was afraid he was going to hurt my dad or pull him down. Never even mentioned being afraid for his dad. Not once. Anything about the English's boat or anything being stolen from 220. Never mentioned it. Never talked about it. Two hour and 45 minute interview. Doesn't talk about any of this stuff. Assume the worst. Here's what he did. So he stopped and I said, hey, just want to talk to you, you know. Where are, where are you running from? Where are you going? This is what he says he said. He's asking Ahmad about what he was doing that day. That day. 
because he didn't know what he'd done that day, but he assumed the worst. He must have committed some crime. What's your emergency? There's a black man running down the street. What did Agent Seacrest tell you? GBI agent, I can't compel anyone to speak to me. They knew better, just like Agent Seacrest knows. I can't compel anybody to talk to me. All right, let's go ahead and talk about Defendant Bryan. 307 Burford. You've seen his night out video. I'm not playing it for you again. It's motion activated on the porch. Travis McMichael's white 150 pickup truck comes in front. Driveway decision. And this is important, ladies and gentlemen. This is really important. Y'all got him? Why is this important? What does this say? Mr. Bryan, from his porch, can tell that they are chasing and trying to falsely imprison, stop, define, confine Mr. Arbery. He can tell it from his porch. He knows exactly what they're doing. Y'all got him? He knows what they're doing, and you know what he chooses to do? His independent, independent own decision. I'm going to go join him to try and stop this guy, confine and detain him. He just joins in and starts helping. His driveway decision. That is what being a party to the crime is. You go to help some people who are committing some crimes, trying to stop this guy and detain him and confine him. He joined in. Y'all got him? He knew exactly what the McMichaels were doing. <clears throat> what did Mr. Bryan tell you? So I just kind of sat there for a minute and didn't really know what to do. And then he was trucking. So I mean, he closed in on me quick. And as soon as he got up to me, I overshot the road. I was kind of angled. I overshot the road and forced him to go down into the ditch right there. Aggravated assault with a pickup truck on Mr. Bryan's verdict form. Check. And I angled my truck at him again. I think he kind of turned around. I missed him or whatever. I missed him. He was intending to hit him. I missed him. I mean, when you say, well, I missed him, what does that mean you were trying to do? You were trying to hit this person. Then at the scene, he tells Officer Minshew, one time when I cornered him up over here on Burford, he was trying to get in my truck. He tried to get <coughs> in my door. Trying to get in his door. Or, Mr. Bryan, did you get so close to Mr. Arbery that Mr. Arbery had to push off from your truck, getting white fibers from his t-shirt and his palm print on your truck? Because you got so close to hitting him, he had to push off to get away from you. I mean, I can't say for sure that he, he wasn't on the door. I didn't give him a chance to get to the door, but after I angled him off the side of the road, you know, and I kind of went on past him because I didn't hit him, wish I would have, might have took him out and not got him shot. But, you know, I probably got past him a little bit, and he comes up on me, and I could see him in my mirror, and he was coming to the door, and I see his hands right behind the door. After I angled him off the side of the road, I kind of went on past him. I didn't give him a chance to get to the door. Yeah, towards the entrance, towards the entrance. But I, I confronted him again. I angled at him again. We're now at aggravated assault number three. Before we got to the road he was lying on, Right at that house that's on the left-hand side, you're heading towards the entrance of the neighborhood. So he confronted him once again, right there at that corner of Holmes and Satilla. I was fixing. I put it in reverse and was going to back up at him. And that's when he made his move to go down the road it happened on. Felony murder, right here. Felony murder for criminal attempt at false imprisonment. Felony murder for aggravated assault with a pickup truck. Mr. Bryan kept Mr. Arbery from running down Satilla Drive and out of Satilla Shores. He redirected him up homes. But for those actions, Mr. Arbery would be alive. Played a necessary and substantial part in the death of Mr. Arbery. All right, so I backed up and started going down that way. I think I angled at him again. Kind of forced him off the road or something right in here. And he turned around. He turned around right here. The black guy did. He turned around maybe down this far or so. He turned around and started running back the other way. And I pulled into a drive or something and started to turn around. 
fourth aggravated assault with a pickup truck. There's his rap. There's the McMichael route, and here it is all together. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, the indictment. How in the world could Defendant Bryan be held responsible if he was in his Silverado filming the murder at the time Travis McMichael murdered Ahmaud Arbery? How can Greg McMichael be held responsible? Okay, it's real simple. Party to a crime. The law does, in Georgia, believe that everybody who helped, encouraged, advised, went inside a house and grabbed their son and told him to get a shotgun and come on, they're all equally responsible for the ultimate death of the victim. Because a person is a party to a crime only if that person directly commits the crime. Travis McMichael, pulling the trigger on the shotgun, helps in the commission of the crime. He wouldn't have been able to do that if not for his father and if not for Mr. Bryan. Intentionally advises, encourages. That's what Greg McMichael's doing. Cut him off, cut him off. Go this way. No, I'm going to go that way. What are they doing in the truck? They're working together, Greg and Travis McMichael. That's why they're both responsible. Laura Hope got up here and said, Greg McMichael's not a murderer. Yes, he is. Greg McMichael is just as big a murderer as Travis McMichael is because he's a party to this crime. Okay? When three people chase an unarmed man in two pickup trucks with guns in order to violate his personal liberty, who gets to claim, I'm not really responsible for that? Under the law in Georgia, no one gets to say that. Everybody is responsible. All right, how? All right, I'm going to give you an example. This is just an illustration, just to make a point, okay? Four men drive to a bank to commit an armed robbery. All right? You got the driver who never gets out of the car. You got the lookout who stands outside. You got a guy who goes in without a gun. And you got a guy who goes in the bank and shoots the guard. All right? So who's guilty? Under the law in Georgia, all of them are responsible for aggravated assault, for shooting the guard, and armed robbery for trying to rob the bank or robbing the bank. All right? Because they committed the crime or they helped in the commission of the crime or they advised and encouraged someone to commit the crime. And of course you're saying, but Linda, only one person had their finger on the trigger in this case, and that was Travis McMichael. So how do we find Greg McMichael and William Roddy Bryant guilty of malice murder? Well, under the law in Georgia, it's as if they were all holding the gun together. And in this example, the guy who never got out of the car and was the getaway driver is just as guilty. In this example, the guy who got out of the car and just stood at the front of the bank is just as guilty. Party to a crime. So under the law, all are involved. Why? Well, Greg McMichael, he was seeking to confront Ahmaud Arbery. He was encouraging Travis McMichael to come with him, encouraging Travis to cut him off. Greg McMichael threatened Ahmaud to get him to stop. Okay? We would not be here if it weren't for Greg McMichael. Travis McMichael, without Travis McMichael deciding to actually take his shotgun and help his dad. He could have told his dad, we're not doing this. Calm down. Call the police. There's a whole bunch of decisions both of them could have made that would never have resulted in Ahmaud Arbery's death. <coughs> he decided he was going to drive his pickup truck to chase Ahmaud, and he got out of that truck with that shotgun, totally and absolutely unnecessarily. Mr. Bryan, who decided to help the McMichaels, without Bryan, who then assaulted Ahmaud in his pickup truck in an effort to falsely imprison him on Burford, without him redirecting Ahmaud onto home, without Brian chasing him on toward Travis McMichael, we wouldn't be here because Ahmaud Arbery would not be dead. doesn't matter who actually pulled the trigger. Under the law, they're all guilty, even of malice murder. All right, let's take a look at the crime scene. Of note, Ahmaud Arbery had nothing on him, no bag, no backpack, no burglary. No cell phone, no ID, no wallet, no keys, no gun, no weapon, nothing. I'm going to show you some crime scene photos. So what do we have? All right, take a look at this. This is what's important in this picture. These pants are so baggy. Look at this. Look how baggy they are. Look where his belt is. He's running like this. There's no way they believe he had a gun on him. Absolutely no way. Strawberry was shot. 
first in the torso and through the wrist. All right? He was shot this way, where it came out this way. So what's he doing? He's coming around that corner. Here it is, here it is. His wrist gets shot. There's no way he's striking Travis McMichael. There's no way he's hitting him. I, I don't, we don't know. Did he grab the end of the shotgun? Did he try and push it away? Who knows? What we do know is it happened like this, and Travis McMichael fired. They struggle over the gun. Yeah, then they're struggling over the gun. Two more gunshots, and he gets shot under his left armpit. I am going to show you the crime scene photo. So what do we have? Why do we know he got shot in the wrist? Because of the blood spatter, the arterial spurt. Remember? Okay. Why is there blood here in the road in this driveway? From the arterial spurt from the wrist. That's how we know the wrist got shot when he was shot in the torso. And there's the evidence of it in the crime scene photos. What do we also know? Here's the gunshot wound to the torso. Here's the gunshot wound under the armpit. Both lethal, lethal injuries. Travis McMichael, at the end of his interview, the very end of his interview with Detective Nohilly, do you remember if he grabbed the shotgun at all? I want to say he did, but I honestly cannot remember. If he grabbed that shotgun, that would be the first thing Travis McMichael would have said. Yeah, he grabbed my shotgun. All right, we are going to talk about Greg McMichael. Greg McMichael did attempt to control the narrative after this took place. He's the one who started this whole thing, and now his son has killed someone. And the, that young man is laying dead in the street from these shotgun blasts. So what does Greg McMichael do? Well, while first responders are on the scene, he's going up and he's telling his kid, you didn't have any choice. He goes over and he talks to Brian to find out what he saw. Oh, he's got a video. He goes over and he talks to Diego Press. He's outside the crime scene tape, wandering around, talking to people. Someone brings him his phone. A stranger comes up to him. Some stranger, some neighbor comes up to him. I mean, this is a crime scene. There is a deceased young man in the middle of the road. And strangers are walking up to him. And what does he tell this stranger? This guy ain't no shuffler. This guy's an asshole. Malice. Right there. That's how you know. Right there. 2.15 p.m. He's talking to Captain Tom Jump, the head of CID the head of the Criminal Investigations Division of Glen County Police Department, while Tom Jump's crime scene tech is taking photos. Okay? And then Greg McMichael drives his white truck from the scene. Sheila Ramos never got any pictures of the white truck. Sheila Ramos never got any pictures of the Silverado. Hmm. The white truck was never searched. Mr. Bryan's truck was never searched. Neither of those trucks were impounded. So what do we got? We got this. Outside the crime scene tape, talking to the head of CID. And what happens? In, look at the crime scene photos. Take a look at them. What happens next? He drives that truck away. While the crime scene tech is there taking photos. No one said Mr. Arbery had a weapon. Nobody said Mr. Arbery made any verbal threats or gestures. Nobody said I saw him commit a crime today. No one said I'm making a citizen's arrest. No one was trying to arrest him for the crime of anything. No one ever said any of these things on February 23rd, 2020. <coughs> Greg McMichael's statements to the police. These are important. This is why Greg McMichael is guilty. Did this guy break into a house today? That's just it. I don't know. That's what I told what's her name out there. I said, listen, you might want to go knock on doors down there because this guy just done something because he was fleeing from. I don't know. He might have gone in somebody's house. You can't make a citizen's arrest because someone's running down the street and you have no idea what crime they have committed that day. You can't hold somebody so the police can show up to go, well, he must have done something. Why don't you police officers go figure out what it was that he went and did today? But that's what Greg McMichael told the police. Then he was asked, is he picking up anything or going through anything? You know, not that I recall. I don't think the guy has actually stolen anything out of there. Or if he did, it was early on in the process, but he keeps going back over there, over and over again, this damn house. 
No one ever said, we have evidence that he stole items out of Larry English's boat back on some unknown date, so we were trying to arrest him for that. There's never any mention of Larry English's house and the stolen items off the boat. Not by anybody. My intention was to stop this guy so they could be arrested. Never says for what. Never says what crime it was he was going to be arrested for. I don't think the guy's actually stolen anything. Did he break into a house today? I don't know. And in that same sentence, he could be arrested or at least identified. So this is all for identification. This, this whole entire thing, this, this was all to do what? Identify Mr. Arbery. That's what we're doing. That's what Greg Michael says. How do you know it was an attack on Mr. Arbery? Strangers with intent to kill. I yelled, stop or I'll blow your fucking head off or something. I want him to know that we weren't playing. This is what he said to the police. Now, Lorho got up here and went, oh, uh, yeah, he was just confused. He didn't mean that. He was really, he, was, he didn't remember what he said. Really? He proudly told the police, this is what he said to Mr. Arbery. We're going to kill you if you don't stop. Gregory Michael. Yeah, he was trapped like a rat. Knowledge, intent, that they had committed false imprisonment on Holmes Drive. Right there. Greg McMichael, guilty of all charges. Why? What's your emergency? I'm out here in Satilla Shores, and there's a black man running down the street. Yeah, this is what we get. This is what we get. Driveway decisions and assumptions. Right here. We've gone through all this. I'm not going to do it again. Bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, they committed four <coughs> felonies against Devon Arbery in violation of his personal liberty before he finally tried to run around their truck after running from them for five minutes. He was trying to get away from these strangers who are yelling at him, yelling at him, threatening to kill him. And then they killed him. Do you have any doubt that they committed all of the charges in the indictment? No. No. Remember, a reasonable doubt does not mean a vague or arbitrary doubt, but it's a doubt for which a reason can be given. In other words, you say it out loud. I doubt William Roddy Bryan was committing aggravated assault with his pickup truck because it was just reckless conduct. If you can honestly look each other in the eye and say that about Mr. Bryan with a straight face, ladies and gentlemen, you're the jury. You decide. This is your search for the truth. If you honestly can look at each other and say that out loud, then, then find him not guilty of the aggravated assault. Find him guilty of a lesser. Because you decide. You are Glen County. I mean, today you are Glen County. Remember, this isn't about having personal baggage back in the jury room. It's not about a point of view or an agenda or anything like that. That's not what's going on. You all are really, really smart, and you've paid really, really close attention to this case. You're going to determine what really happened based on the evidence, and then you're going to apply the law that the judge gives you to that evidence. It's not about being an advocate for anybody. It's your search for the truth. I suggest once again that you work from the bottom of the indictment. It's just going to be easier. Criminal attempt at false imprisonment, and then work your way through it. It'll help you logically. Remember party to a crime when you're talking about Greg McMichael and Mr. Bryan. You're going to get a verdict form. The state is asking you to fill it out this way, especially for Mr. Bryan and the aggravated assault with the pickup trucks. He's not <coughs> guilty of simple assault. He's not guilty of reckless conduct. He's not guilty of reckless driving. He's guilty of aggravated assault. 
for putting Ahmad Arbery in reasonable apprehension, fear of receiving serious bodily injury. I overshot the road and forced him into a ditch. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. This isn't about whether these three men are good people or bad people. That's not what this is about. It's about responsibility. It's about holding people accountable and responsible for their actions. When they do something like this, they have to be held accountable and responsible. Nobody gets a free pass. Okay? Would you get a free pass? Who gets a free pass? No. The law basically says if you commit the crime, you're going to be held responsible. And ladies and gentlemen, when you come back with a guilty verdict on all the charges, this isn't saying somebody's a good person or a bad person. What you're saying is, you know you committed the crime. Now we know you committed the crime too. That's all it is. They know what they did. It's not like they don't know what they did. They know exactly what they did and they know why they did it. It's not a mystery to them. When you come back with your guilty verdict, all you're doing is telling them, we know what you did too. And we're going to hold you responsible for it. Because guess what you did? You turned this young man into that young man. That's what you did. For absolutely no good reason at all. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you to find all three defendants guilty of all the charges in the indictment. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute recess, and then we're going to come back with the charge of the court. Do not begin your discussions or deliberations in this case until you have received the final charge of the court. Again, with about 10 minutes, and we'll come back and get that onto the record. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take a 10 minute recess. Uh, 2211 will reach me. Thank you.
We're back on Defendant's President represented by counsel. The court has the charge. Let's go ahead and get the panel. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You are considering the case of the state of Georgia versus Travis McMichael, Gregory McMichael, and William R. Bryan. Now that the evidence and the arguments of counsel have been submitted to you, it becomes my duty to give you the final instructions of the court as to the law applicable in this case. As I told you at the outset, it is my duty and responsibility to ascertain the law applicable to this case and to instruct you on that law. You are bound by these instructions. It is your responsibility to ascertain the facts of the case from all the evidence presented. Then. You must apply the law I give you in the charge to the facts as you find them to be. It is your duty to follow the law as stated in the instructions I have given you and am about to give you. You should not single out one instruction alone, but must consider all the instructions as a whole. You have a sworn duty to decide this case based upon the law given you by the court and upon the evidence submitted during the trial. The defendants. Travis McMichael, Gregory McMichael, and William R. Bryan, in this case, had been indicted each individually and as parties concerned in the commission of a crime by the grand jury of this county for the offenses of malice murder, felony murder, four counts, aggravated assault, two counts, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit a felony. The indictment was returned into court on June 24th of 2020. You will have the indictment with you at the end of the case, and you should consult it for the specific allegations brought by the state. The defendants have each entered a plea of not guilty to the indictment. The indictment and the pleas form the issues that you are to decide. Neither the indictment nor the pleas of not guilty should be considered as evidence. The defendants are charged in the indictment with crimes that are violations of certain laws of the state of Georgia. I want to emphasize to you that the indictment, including all of the counts therein, and the pleas of not guilty are the legal procedures by which these criminal charges are brought against each defendant. The charges in the plea of not guilty are not evidence of guilt, and you should not consider them as evidence or implication of guilt of any crime whatsoever. The defendants are presumed innocent until each is proven guilty. 
Each defendant enters upon the trial of the case with a presumption of innocence in his favor. And this presumption remains with the defendant until it is overcome by the state with evidence that is sufficient to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the crime or crimes charged. No person shall be convicted of any crime unless and until each element of the crime is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof rests upon the state to prove every material allegation of the indictment and every essential element of the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the state is not required to prove the guilt of the accused beyond all doubt or to a mathematical certainty. A reasonable doubt means just what it says. It is a doubt of a fair-minded, impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. It is a doubt based upon common sense and reason. It does not mean a vague or arbitrary doubt, but it is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence, a conflict in the evidence, or any combination of these. There is no burden of proof upon the defendants whatsoever, and the burden never shifts to the defendant to prove his innocence. When a defense is raised by the evidence, the burden is upon the state to negate or disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Though you may consider all of the evidence as a whole, conviction of one defendant does not necessarily require conviction of another. You, the jury, must determine whether the state has proven the guilt of each defendant beyond a reasonable doubt as to each count. If, after giving consideration to all of the facts and circumstances of this case, your minds are wavering, unsettled, or unsatisfied, then that is a doubt of the law, and you must acquit that defendant. But if that doubt does not exist in your minds about the guilt of the accused, then you will be authorized to convict that defendant. If the state fails to prove a defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, it would be your duty to acquit that defendant. Facts and circumstances that merely place upon a defendant a grave suspicion of the crime or crimes charged, or that merely raise a speculation or conjecture of a defendant's guilt are not sufficient to authorize a conviction of a defendant. Now your oath requires that you will decide this case based on the evidence. Evidence is the means by which any fact that is put in issue is established or disproved. Evidence includes all of the testimony of the witnesses or the equivalent, such as depositions, any exhibits admitted during the trial, and stipulations of the attorneys. As I've previously charged you, a stipulation is an agreement between the parties concerning some fact or facts which you, as the jury, are bound to accept as facts during your deliberations. Evidence does not include the indictment, the plea of not guilty, opening or closing remarks of the attorneys, or questions asked by the attorneys. Evidence may be either direct or circumstantial or both. In considering the evidence, you may, excuse me, in considering the evidence, you may use reasoning and common sense to make deductions and reach conclusions. You should not be concerned about whether the evidence is direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is the testimony of a person who asserts that he or she has actual knowledge of a fact. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a set of facts and circumstances that tend to prove or disprove another fact by inference. There's no legal difference in the weight that you may give to either direct or circumstantial evidence. Whether dependent upon direct evidence or circumstantial evidence or both, the true test is whether there is sufficient evidence or whether the evidence is sufficiently convincing to satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt. If not, you must acquit. If so, you may convict. There's no rule that either circumstantial or direct evidence is stronger than the other if conflicting. The comparative weight of circumstantial evidence and direct evidence on any given issue is a question of fact for the jury to decide. A testimony has been given in this case by certain witnesses who are termed experts. Expert witnesses are those who, because of their training and experience, possess knowledge in a particular field that is not common knowledge or known to the average citizen. The law permits expert witnesses to give their opinions based upon that training and experience. 
You are not required to accept the testimony of any witness, expert or otherwise. Testimony of an expert, like that of all witnesses, is to be given only such weight and credit as you think it is properly entitled to receive. Now, the jury must determine the credibility of witnesses. In deciding this, you may consider all of the facts and circumstances of the case, the witness's manner of testifying, the witness's means and opportunity of knowing the facts about which they testify, the nature of the facts about the the nature of the facts about which the witness testified, the probability or improbability of their testimony, the witness's interest or lack of interest in the outcome of the case, the witness's personal credibility insofar as it may have been shown in your presence and by the evidence, any evidence of bias for or against a party, any possible motive in testifying if shown by the evidence in that regard, you are authorized to consider any possible pending prosecutions, negotiated pleas, grants of immunity or leniency, or similar matters, and whether a witness has been impeached. The question whether a witness has been impeached is whether you, the jury, believe the witness has been proved unworthy of belief. A witness may be impeached by disproving the facts to which the witness testified. Your assessment of a trial witness's credibility may be affected by comparing or contrasting that testimony to statements or testimony of that same witness before the trial started. It is for you to decide whether there is a reasonable explanation for any inconsistency in a witness's pretrial statements and testimony when compared to the same witness's trial testimony. As with all issues of witness credibility, you, the jury, must apply your common sense and reason to decide what testimony you believe or do not believe. The testimony of a single witness, if believed, is sufficient to establish a fact. Generally, there is no legal requirement of corroboration of a witness, provided you find the evidence to be sufficient. Now, the defendant in a criminal case is under no duty to present any evidence tending to prove innocence and is not required to take the stand and testify in the case. If the defendant elects not to testify, no inference, hurtful, harmful, or adverse to the defendant shall be drawn by the jury, nor shall such fact be held against the defendant in any way. A number of statements that the defendants have allegedly made were offered for your consideration. Before you may consider any of these as evidence for any purpose, you must determine whether the individual statements were voluntary. To be voluntary, a statement must be freely and willingly given and without coercion, duress, threats, use of violence, fear of injury, or any suggestions or promises of leniency or reward. A statement induced by the slightest hope of benefit or the remotest fear of injury is not voluntary. To be voluntary, a statement must be the product of a free will and not under compulsion or any necessity imposed by others. The burden of proof is upon the state to establish that the statement was voluntary, that is, freely and willingly made. If you do not find that the statement was voluntary, you may not consider it for any purpose. You should consider with great care and caution the evidence of any out-of-court statement allegedly made by a defendant offered by the state. The jury may believe any such statement in whole or in part, believing that which you find to be true and rejecting that which you find to be untrue. You alone have the duty to apply the general rules for testing the believability of witnesses and to decide what weight should be given to all or any part of such evidence. A defendant's out-of-court statement that is not supported by any other evidence is not sufficient to justify a conviction, even if you believe the unsupported statement. However, proof by other evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime alleged has been committed may constitute supporting evidence of a defendant's statement, if any, should so you find. The law does not fix the amount of supporting evidence necessary. You must determine whether or not 
other evidence sufficiently supports the defendant's statement so as to justify a conviction. If you find that there was a statement made by a defendant that was supported by other evidence, the degree of proof necessary to convict is that you be satisfied of the guilt of a defendant beyond any reasonable doubt. Any out-of-court statement made by one of the defendants on trial in this case after the alleged criminal act has ended may be considered only against the person who made the statement and only if you find that such statement was freely and voluntarily made. If you find that an out-of-court statement was made to the police freely and voluntarily by a defendant on trial in this case, then you are to consider the statement only as against the particular defendant who made it. Now, members of the jury, this court is responsible for determining the admissibility of certain evidence with regard to statements in this case. Sometimes full audio and or video recordings cannot be played for you for legal reasons. You are not to make any inferences for or against either party in the case about the fact that the law does not allow the playing of certain recordings by the parties in this case. Now, evidence of prior difficulties or lack thereof between one or more of the defendants and Mr. Aubrey has been admitted for the sole purpose of illustrating, if it does, the state of feeling between the defendants and Mr. Aubrey and the reasonableness of any alleged fears by the defendants or Mr. Aubrey. Whether this evidence illustrates such matters is a matter solely for you, the jury, to determine. But you are not to consider such evidence for any other purposes. Certain evidence of fingerprint comparison has been admitted by the court for your possible consideration. Identification by fingerprint comparison is opinion evidence and is dependent upon the credibility or believability and accuracy of the expert witness called for that purpose as well as the following factors. One, the validity of the theory of identification by fingerprint comparison. Two, the credibility of the witness who performs other necessary functions in making the comparison, such as inked finger impressions and latent lifts. And three, the accuracy of procedures in identifying, preserving, recording, and maintaining integrity of the physical evidence, all of which are questions for the jury. Now, the defendants are charged with crimes against the laws of this state. A crime is a violation of a statute of this state in which there is a joint operation of an act and intention. Intent is an essential element of any crime and must be proved by the state beyond a reasonable doubt. Intent may be shown in many ways, provided you, the jury, believe that it existed from the proven facts before you. It may be inferred from the proven circumstances or by acts and conduct, or it may be in your discretion inferred when it is the natural and necessary consequence of the act. Whether or not you draw such an inference is a matter solely within your discretion. Criminal intent does not mean an intention to violate the law or to violate a penal statute, but means simply the intention to commit the act that is prohibited by the statute. The defendants will not be presumed to have acted with criminal intent, but you may find such an intention upon a consideration of words, conduct, demeanor, motive, and other circumstances connected with the act for which the accused are being prosecuted. Now, every party to a crime may be charged with and convicted of commission of the crime. A person is a party to a crime only if that person, A, directly commits the crime, B, intentionally helps in the commission of the crime, or C, intentionally advises, encourages, hires, counsels, or procures another to commit the crime. Any party to a crime who did not directly commit the crime may be prosecuted for commission of the crime upon proof that the crime was committed and that the person was a party to it, even though the person alleged to have directly committed the crime has not been prosecuted or convicted, 
has been convicted of a different crime or degree of crime, is not amenable to justice, or has been acquitted. Knowledge on the part of a defendant that a crime was being committed and that a defendant knowingly and intentionally participated in or helped in the commission of such crime must be proved by the state beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find from the evidence in this case that a defendant had no knowledge that a crime was being committed or that a defendant did not knowingly and intentionally commit, participate, or help in the commission of the alleged offense, then it would be your duty to acquit that defendant. On the other hand, should you find beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant had knowledge that a crime was being committed and that a <coughs> defendant knowingly and intentionally participated or helped in the commission of it, then you would be authorized to convict that defendant. A person shall not be found guilty of a crime if the act or omission to act constituting the crime was induced by a misapprehension of fact that, if true, would have justified the act or omission. Now, the law provides that criminal action shall be tried in the county where the crime was committed. Venue, that is, that the crime was committed in Glynn County, is a jurisdictional fact that must be proved by the state beyond a reasonable doubt as to each crime charged in the indictment just as any element of the offense. Venue must be proved by direct or circumstantial evidence or both. The defendants are charged with the offenses of malice murder, felony murder in four counts, aggravated assault, two counts, and false imprisonment, I'm sorry, false imprisonment and criminal attempt to commit a felony. I will now define the offenses for you. For malice mur murder, the state must prove that the defendant, one, caused the death of another person, two, unlawfully, and three, with malice of forethought. The killing must have been done with malice to be murder. Malice, as the term is used here, is not necessarily ill will or hatred. Rather, it is the unlawful intent to kill without justification. You may find malice when the circumstances show that a defendant acted in the deliberate, or I'm sorry, with the deliberate intention to unlawfully take the life of another person. You may also find malice when there does not appear to be significant provocation and all the circumstances of the killing show an abandoned and malignant heart. The state does not have to prove premeditation to prove murder. If the killing is done with malice, it is murder, regardless of how briefly the malicious intent existed. No specific length of time is required for malice to arise in a defendant's mind. Malice may be formed in a moment and instantly a fatal wound may be inflicted. If malice was in a defendant's mind at the time of the act or the killing and moved a defendant to do it, that is enough for the killing to be murder. The state does not have to prove motive to prove murder. Any evidence of modus, modus excuse me, any evidence of motive has been admitted for your use in determining a defendant's state of mind at the time of the killing. A person also commits the crime of felony murder when, in the commission of a felony, that person causes the death of another human being. Under the laws of Georgia, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment are all felonies that will be defined later in this charge. You may find a defendant guilty of felony murder if you believe that he caused the death of another person by committing one of the felonies just described, regardless of whether he intended the death to occur. There must be some causal connection between the felony and the death. Felony murder is not established simply because the death occurred at the same time as or shortly after the felony was attempted or committed. The felony must have directly caused the death or played a substantial and necessary part in causing the death, regardless of when the death ultimately occurred. A person commits the offense of aggravated assault when that person assaults another person with a deadly weapon or with any object, device, or instrument that, 
when used offensively against a person is likely to or actually does result in serious bodily injury. To constitute such an assault, actual injury to the alleged victim need not be shown. It is only necessary that the evidence show beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant attempted to cause a violent injury to the alleged victim or intentionally committed an act that placed the alleged victim in reasonable fear of immediately receiving a violent injury. As to count six of the indictment, the state must prove as a material element of aggravated assault, as alleged in this case, that the assault was made with a deadly weapon. As to count seven of the indictment, the state must prove as a material element of aggravated assault, as alleged in this case, that the assault was made with an object, device, or instrument that, when used offensively against a person, is likely to or does actually result in serious bodily injury. A firearm, when used in the way a firearm is ordinarily used, is a deadly weapon. In deciding whether a pickup truck is an offensive weapon in this case, you may consider all of the following factors. The nature and extent of any injury inflicted, the character or capabilities of the weapon, the manner in which it was used, any display of it to the jury, any other circumstances and any other circumstances of the case. Whether or not, under all of the facts and circumstances of this case, a pickup truck, as alleged in this bill of indictment, did in fact constitute a weapon likely to cause serious bodily injury, is a matter to be solely, I'm sorry, is a matter to be decided by the jury from the evidence in this case. Now on count seven, as to defendant William R. Bryan, you may consider the following lesser offenses which will be presented on his verdict form. Simple assault. A person commits simple assault when that person attempts to commit a violent injury to the person of another. Reckless conduct. A person commits reckless conduct when that person endangers the bodily safety of another person by consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his act or omission will cause harm or endanger the safety of another person and the disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care which a reasonable person would exercise in the situation. And reckless driving. A person commits the offense of reckless driving by driving any vehicle in reckless disregard for the safety of persons or property. If you do not believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant William R. Bryan is guilty of aggravated assault as alleged in count seven of the indictment, but you do believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant William R. Bryan is guilty of the lesser offenses just listed, you would be authorized to find the defendant William R. Bryan guilty of the lesser and should so indicate on the verdict form. Continuing now with the charges set forth in the indictment, a person commits the offense of false imprisonment when, in violation of the personal liberty of another, he arrests, confines, or detains such person without legal authority. A person commits criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment when, with intent to commit false imprisonment, that person performs any act that constitutes a substantial step toward the commission of the crime of false imprisonment, which has been previously defined for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I charge you that where, as here in count seven and nine of the indictment, the state alleges that the defendants committed a crime in more than one way, the state need not prove that the defendants committed the crime in each way charged. Rather, it is sufficient if you, the jury, should find, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendants committed the crime in at least one of the ways alleged. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the defendants have raised a defense that even if they committed the acts described in the indictment, there are circumstances that justify it. Once this defense is raised, the state must disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that a person's conduct is justified is a defense to prosecution for any crime based on that conduct. 
The defense of justification can be claimed, A, when the person's conduct is justified as the use of force in defense of self, or when the person's conduct is reasonable and is performed in the course of making a lawful arrest. A private person may arrest an offender if the offense is committed in his presence or within his immediate knowledge. If the offense is a felony and the offender is escaping or attempting to escape, a private person may arrest him upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion. The terms in his presence and within his immediate knowledge are synonymous in a crime committed in one's presence only if, by the exercise of any of his senses, he has knowledge of its commission or by the accused admitting that such a crime is being or has been committed. A private person may not act on the unsupported statement of others alone. A private citizen's warrantless arrest must occur immediately after the perpetration of the offense or in the case of felonies during escape. If the observer fails to make the arrest immediately after the commission of the offense or during escape in the case of felonies, his power to do so is extinguished. A private person may arrest an offender upon reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion, that is, on probable cause, which is defined as facts and circumstances that are sufficient to warrant a prudent person or one of reasonable caution in believing in the circumstances shown that the suspect has committed an offense. The facts necessary to establish probable cause for arrest are much less than those required to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. The test merely requires a probability, less than a certainty, but more than a mere suspicion or possibility. In determining whether probable cause exists, the totality of the circumstances must be considered. Whether probable cause existed is for the determination of the jury. Now, an arrest is defined as the taking, seizing, or detaining of the person of another, either by touching or putting hands on him, or by any act indicating an intention to take such person into custody and which subjects such person to the actual control and will of the person making the, the arrest. An arrest can occur even when a subject is not told that he is under arrest. A person is authorized to use in making a lawful arrest only that degree of force that is reasonably necessary to accomplish the arrest. The mere fact that a lawful arrest is being made does not give the person the right to use excessive force or an unlawful degree of force upon the, re upon the person being arrested. One upon whom an illegal or unlawful arrest is being made has the right to resist the arrest if such force as is reasonably necessary. Let me read that again. One upon whom an illegal or unlawful arrest is being made has the right to resist the arrest with such force as is reasonably necessary to prevent the arrest. A person commits the offense of criminal trespass when that person knowingly and without authority, A, enters upon the land or premises of another person for an unlawful purpose. B, enters upon the land or premises of another person after receiving, prior to entry, notice from the owner, rightful occupant, or, upon proper identification, an authorized representative of the owner or rightful occupant, that entry is forbidden, or remains upon the land or premises of another person after receiving notice from the owner, rightful occupant, or, upon proper identification, an authorized representative of the owner or rightful occupant to depart. A person commits the offense of burglary in the first degree when without authority and with the intent to commit a theft therein, that person enters or remains within the dwelling of another. For purposes of this law, a dwelling includes any house, building, or structure which is designed or intended for occupancy for residential use. It makes no difference whether the building or structure was occupied, unoccupied, or vacant. However, 
you may consider occupation status in determining whether or not the structure in question was designed or intended for residential use. To constitute the offense of burglary, it is not necessary that it be shown that a break-in occurred. To constitute entry, the evidence need only show a breaking of the plane of the structure alleged by the offender or by any part of his body or by any instrument controlled by him. The evidence need not show that an actual theft was accomplished. However, an intent to commit a theft, that is, an intent to steal, is an essential element of burglary. You may infer an intent to steal where the evidence shows an unlawful entry without authority into the place of another where items of some value are present or kept inside and, whether there, and where there is no other apparent motive for the entry. Whether or not you make such an inference is a matter solely for you, the jury, to determine. A person commits the crime of hijacking a motor vehicle in the second degree when such person obtains a motor vehicle from an individual without his or her consent. Now, the defendants have raised affirmative defenses claiming that even if the acts described in the indictment were committed, there are circumstances that justify them. Once an affirmative defense is raised, the state must disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that a person's conduct is justified is a defense to prosecution for any crime based on that conduct. The defense of justification can be claimed as self-defense and as citizen's arrest. Sometimes a defendant's threat or use of force is legally justified, so is, so is not a crime. Let me read that again. Sometimes a defendant's threat or use of force is legally justified, and so is not a crime. A defendant is justified in threatening or using force against another when, one, he reasonably believes that the threat or use of force is necessary, two, to defend himself or a third person, and three, against the other person's imminent use of unlawful force. A defendant is justified in using force that is intended or likely to cause death or serious bodily injury when, one, he reasonably believes that the use of such force is necessary, two, to prevent, A, death or serious bodily injury to himself or a third person, or B, the commission of a forcible felony, which means a felony that involves the use of force or violence against another. Aggravated assault is, again, a felony which can occur by use of fists if they are used as an offensive weapon. The state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's actions were not justified. If you decide a defendant's actions were justified, then it would be your duty to find the defendant not guilty. A defendant is not justified in threatening or using force if he provokes the threat or use of force, intending to use that threat or force as an excuse to harm the other person, is committing a felony, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment are felonies that have been pre previously defined, or is the unjustified initial aggressor unless he withdraws from the encounter and clearly communicates to the other person his intent to withdraw and the other person continues or threatens to continue the use of unlawful force. For a defendant's threat or use of force to be justified, one, the defendant must believe that his threat or use of force is necessary. Two, that belief must be reasonable, that is, a reasonable person would also believe that the threat or use of force is necessary. And three, the defendant's reasonable belief must be what prompts him to threaten or use force. A person who is not the aggressor is not required to retreat before being justified in using force he reasonably believes to be necessary. A defendant is not justified in using excessive force while acting in self-defense. If you decide that a defendant used more force than was reasonably necessary to defend against the alleged victim's threats or use of force, then the defendant's actions would not be justified. Now, if, after considering the testimony and evidence presented to you, together with the charge of the court, 
you should find and believe beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant in Glynn County, Georgia, did on February 23, 2020, commit the offenses as alleged in the indictment, you would be authorized to find the defendant guilty. In that event, the form of your verdict would be, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. If you do not believe that a defendant is guilty, or if you have any reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt, then it would be your duty to acquit the defendant, in which event the form of your verdict would be, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Though you may consider all of the evidence as a whole, conviction of one defendant does not necessarily require conviction of another or all. You, the jury, must determine the guilt or innocence of each defendant separately. You will, be giving a you will be given a special verdict form for each defendant to use when you retire. You are to consider each count separately. In the space provided on the verdict form, you will indicate either guilty or not guilty depending on your verdict for that count and that defendant. Now I want to emphasize that anything the court did or said during the course of this, uh, this case was not intended to and did not intimate, hint, or suggest to you which of the parties should prevail in this case. Whichever of the parties is entitled to a verdict is a matter entirely for you to determine. And whatever your verdict, it must be agreed upon by all of you. The court's interest in the matter is that the case be fairly presented according to the law and that you as honest, conscientious, impartial jurors consider the case as the court has instructed you and return a verdict that speaks the truth as you find the truth of the case to be. Your verdict should be a true verdict based upon your opinion of the evidence according to the laws given you in this charge. You are not to show favor or sympathy to one party or the other. It is your duty to consider the facts objectively without favor, affection, or sympathy to any party. In deciding this case, you should not be influenced by sympathy or prejudice because of race, creed, color, religion, national origin, sexual preference, local or remote residence, or economic status for or against either party. Now, you are only concerned with the guilt or innocence of each defendant. You are not to concern yourselves with punishment. One of your first duties in the jury room will be to choose one of you as, uh, to be the foreperson who will manage your deliberations and who will sign the verdict to which all 12 of you freely and voluntarily agree. You should start your deliberations with an open mind. Talk with each other and consider each other's views. Each of you must decide this case for yourself, but you should do so only after a discussion and consideration of the case with your fellow jurors. Do not hesitate to change an opinion if you are convinced that it is wrong. However, you should never surrender an honest opinion in order to be congenial or to reach a verdict solely because of the opinions of the other jurors. During deliberations, you must not communicate with anyone other than your fellow jurors about this case. You may not use any electronic device or media, such as a telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone, I still have Blackberry in this, uh, computer, the internet, any internet service, or any text or instant messaging service, or any internet chat room, blog, or website such as Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, the list goes on and on. You cannot use any of those to communicate to anyone any information about this case or to conduct any research about this case until I accept your verdict. Whatever your verdict is, it must be unanimous, that is, agreed by all, as to each count of the indictment and as to each defendant. Each verdict must be in writing and signed by one of your members as foreperson, dated and returned to be published in open court. I do ask whoever the foreperson is, please write in pen. Please don't sign the verdict form in pencil. Now, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, you may retire to the jury room, but do not begin your deliberations until you have received the indictment and the evidence that has been admitted in the case. We do need to separate out the three alternates. Three of you are alternates, uh, which we will separate out uh, for deliberations, the three alternates will continue to be jurors in this case and still subject to all of the instructions of the court. If at some point during the proceedings one of the deliberating jurors is not able to complete their uh, duty for the court, 
then the alternate will be brought into deliberations and deliberations will begin again with that alternate. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you retire to the jury room. All right for the jury. Beyond matters already raised in the charge conference, any objection to the charge as read from the state? No, Your Honor. From Traps and Michael. Just renewing our previous objections, Your Honor. Greg and Michael. Uh, yes, just renewing the previous objections um, and exceptions, <coughs> excuse me, which include the reasonable doubt charge, the one sentence, and then later in the charge, the Last sentence of the paragraph concerning the synonymous terms uh, in his presence and within his immediate knowledge to be accepted to a private person may not act on the unsupported statement of statements of others alone. And then the entire next uh, paragraph concerning contemporaneity of the offense and the actions of the person making the arrest. <coughs> and, and I believe the court has already indicated that the arguments made by email on Saturday 22, November 20th, I believe it was, uh, will be put into the record in support of those exceptions. Yeah, I'm going to do that with a notice of filing. Uh, for Mr. Brown. You know, on behalf of Brown, he renew the objections to the charge and exceptions made there too. And although I don't think it's necessary, uh, we will also renew the many motions for mistrial that were made during the trial of the case. <coughs> All right, let's go ahead and check the evidence then. Uh, it is this court's practice with firearms not to send out the um, live ammunition or the weapon itself. I also don't send out the videos. Normally these days, jurors don't have the ability to play the videos, but given the... Uh, well, the court's position is if there's a request to replay a video, it needs to be done with all the formalities of the court. And so they can go ahead and request that, uh, but we do that here, so I don't send them out. Your Honor, do you have the verdict forms? I don't know if I've seen I do that. have, if I have you know, take a look at the verdict forms to see if there's any objections to the verdict forms. I also have a copy of the charge that I will give to the clerk as courts five, I think we're on which will be Courts 5, uh, that will go out to the panel. Go ahead and take a look at that before it goes out also. So I've got the verdict form and the charge. If I could inquire before we end here. I'm sorry? If I could inquire before yeah. we end. Go ahead. Um, did the court take some more time to think about whether the court would bring the jury in and ask them in front of us if anything has come up? We wanted to see that process happen. Uh, I did. I don't think it's necessary here. I, uh, Today, uh, there's very few, if any, people out front that I'm aware of. I haven't heard of anything or any issues. Uh, again, last night, the only reason I moved the jury is because after getting permission from counsel to go into the jury room, I had heard probably, n not as I was walking in, but I heard as I was talking to the panel something that sounded like a crowd outside and asked the panel whether or not they heard that and the response was, they just heard that too. And I thought in, the, in an abundance of caution, uh, not really knowing what exactly was happening outside, that I'd go ahead and move them into the, one of the interior courtrooms. Um, that apparently was, there had been movement outside, there was a protest group that was walking around the courthouse. Um, and uh, I believe what the court did yesterday was appropriate under the circumstances and actually consistent with some of the requests that have been made by counsel. I did not do it because I felt there was any safety concerns or any other problems. I simply did it in an abundance of caution. Um, I don't want to go into where they are now, but I'm satisfied today there have been no issues whatsoever, and so no, I don't plan on going into that inquiry. Uh, but I, I do recall the, the request being made. 
uh, I'm satisfied that there have not been any issues along those lines. And, and I guess I would be joining in that. The record is what it is, but I don't believe the court has inquired of the jury affirmatively a single time from their impanelment to this moment. And I don't think it would be inappropriate given all that has transpired in the public gallery and outside the courthouse in this case for the court to inquire affirmatively at least once of this jury panel. Having said that, I'm going to sit down. Let's go ahead and check the evidence. Um, the proposed verdict form should be somewhere in the well, uh, as well as the, I'm sorry, they're right here. And um, let's go ahead and do that so we can get the uh, evidence to the panel. I had, and I just want to make sure this is consistent with what everyone else in the court has, as the three alternates. Um, currently, I'm going to use their current numbers, 14, 13, and 6. I will get with uh, defense counsel about <coughs> the method that the evidence is in right now where it is in file folders labeled with the numbers and we'll go through it. Yes. Okay, that's good. I'm going to stay on the bench until we have all the, these formalities addressed. So once we know we've got all the evidence together uh, and everybody's had an opportunity to look at the verdict forms, we'll get that addressed.
review the evidence? Yes, Judge. At this time, the state and defense has reviewed all of the evidence. The state and defense have agreed to leave the evidence in the marked file folders, which are numbered for easy convenience for the jury. The state and defense have pulled out Defendant Bryan's number five, which was the lawsuit, which I don't even think was tendered before the jury. In addition, the drone video jump drive has been pulled out since they have no way to play it, along with the jump drive of all the digital evidence that has been played has also been pulled out. We have left Courts Exhibit 3 inside because it's the actual stipulation, but we have pulled Courts Exhibit 4 out, which was a question for the jury. In addition, all of the transcripts regarding the 911 calls have been pulled out. The transcripts for Mr. Bryan's interviews have been pulled out. The transcript for Greg McMichael's interview at Glenn County PD has been pulled out. We have also pulled out the transcripts from Brandon Berry's body cam, Minshew's body cam, and Rash's body cam, so no transcripts are going to go back with the jury. Is that right, Counsel? That's correct, Your Honor. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Has everybody had an opportunity to review the verdict forms? Yes, Your Honor. I did. Yes, Your Honor. Are there any objections to the verdict forms? No objection. No objection. No objection. And I understand there's no objection to the court sending the charge out with the evidence? No objection. No objection. No objection. No objection. All right. We'll do that, and we do have, I think it's the original of the indictment is going out with them, too. All right. Yes, Your Honor. Sounds like we have everything. Anything? Excuse me. Does the original indictment have the grand juror's names on it? It does. It does. Okay. I will double-check it right now. I thought, and it's been so long, that we had asked for their names to be redacted when the indictment goes back. I think the court agreed. The size of the community. And I thought we had done that and agreed to it. But if not, I'd like to move that we either remove the page that has all of their fellow Glynn Countians named as grand jurors because of the possible impermissible influence that could have on a jury. It's a motion I normally do, and if I didn't do it, my apologies before, but it's an easy fix. And I do it because I have had juries before say they were related to or knew somebody on the grand jury, particularly in smaller rural counties. And it just serves no good purpose to leave their names on there. It should have no influence whatsoever on their deliberations. So, therefore, we either move that it be, if it's. .. It's one page. If it's just one page, that it just be removed from the original indictment. No objection from the state. We'll go ahead and do that. So, the redacted copy of the. .. Oh, that's the original, though. Before we start tearing it apart. Would there be any objection, then, instead of tearing apart the original, to using a copy, then, to go out with that page removed? No objection. No objection. No objection. Let's do that. We can just take that. .. It's a one-page one. It's the fourth page. It just has the grand jurors' names. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. That was in mid-thigh. Thank you. 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 Thank you.